Podcast, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we've got the kennel master with us today. It's Mr. Footscray himself. He's a dancing Dougie. They like to call him Nostra Douglas. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got Douglas James Hawkins. Welcome, Dougie. Back to the Inside the Kennel Podcast. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you for that huge rap. And uh, uh, who we got, Matty? Who's our man today? Who are we, who are we talking about? Yeah, well, we know you love the Western Suburbs, boys. This boy oh, came from St Albans. Uh, he's a St Albans lad, and it's oh. Stephen Crediok. A legend. Stephen Crediok. You know what we called him, Paul? Matty? His nickname was uh, Flower. Now, <laughs> after Robert Flower, because St Albans were Melbourne jumpers. Oh. And he must have wore number two. I, I, he must have. Oh, well, why would they call him Robbie Flower? Like Flower, if he's not wearing number two, when he was at St Albans. So his nickname was uh, Flower. Wow. You know that, Matty Paul? From, and, and what from Robbie Flower? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. So w- w- when you get him on, Matty Paul, uh, ask him. Obviously, um, say so Hawk said that your nickname was Flower because of Robbie Flower, and you, he can tell the story. Then, interesting, isn't it? Love that. Yeah, well, Robbie Flower was really graceful. Critter was um, was a bit more rough and tumble. So um, so that's interesting. Yeah, Matty, he's an interesting, he was an interesting player, um, Stephen Critiuk. I, I, I love the way he played. I love the way he played with his passion. Um, his ability to play on the big players. He was strong. He was as strong as a bull. Uh, Matty and Paul, and 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 don't worry about him. He had he had a few tricks. He had a, he had a, he had a little bit of a he had a few bit of side movements and stuff like that. And uh, I think because we played him back deep in the back line, like he would have, he would have played on blokes. It's, it's amazing because he he'd be only he's not much bigger than me six one six two, and he he would have played on Lockett. He would have played on Dunstall, Ablett. He he would have played on them blokes at some stage. I got no doubt about that. He and again, when he first started, I'm sure he was more of a half-back flanker type player, uh, probably in the early, with Terry Wheeler in the early 90s. Uh, and then he developed into this, um, playing on all the big full forwards. Is that a fair call? Yeah, he played on uh, Matty Lloyd. He was actually only Matty six Lloyd. foot, six foot, Doug, he was, 188 yeah. centimetres. So, you know, when, when you're playing on the Ablets and then you've got Lloyd, and Lloyd's, you know, not a, he's a, he's a big unit. Um, he could play on the talls, the smalls, the mids, and, um, you know, amazing. How could he possibly play on that, that size, though, Matty? Huh? Amazing, Paul. He really was. And uh, he just had that ability. He was real strong, Paul. He was really, really, really strong body-wise. Uh, he, he, he didn't lose his feet too often. He had great balance. Uh, great reader of the play, kicks the ball very, very well. Uh, and as Matty and Paul, you mentioned, uh, his, his hardness and toughness and straight at the footy was just unquestionable. Uh, I just loved the way he went about his footy. Um, he was a pro. He was a pro. He trained the way he played. He was um, he was a great role model for the younger players coming through the Bulldogs, make no mistake about that. And uh, uh, how many games did he play, Matty? Would he would have, did he get 200? Would he played that? No, not that many. Yeah, 170. He played 170 games um, and kicked 11 goals as well. 11 goals as well. Um, he, he would have been a part of that group, Paul, that went down the last game of the Witten Over. Was he a part of that group that ran down there to the big Ruckman? What was his name? Gardner. Was he a part of that, you reckon? Yeah, he was. It was Matty Dent and Danny Southern and, you know, all the tough guys. <laughs> <laughs> They made it not a very happy homecoming for the Eagles that day. I don't think Mickey Mel- Mickey Moldes wasn't happy, Paul. Let me tell you. <laughs> now, Dougie, here's an interesting fact you'll like. He's he's infamous for targeting Matthew Loy's injured hand, if you recall, back in 2002, oh, round did. 14. He did. He did too. He, his dad that? was a his dad. His dad Steve's dad was a toughie too. He's a tough bloke from St Albans too. His old man's a ripper bloke. Uh, fantastic fellow and. Uh, he did too. He targeted because he went to shake hand. He kept hitting it, didn't he? 
That's right. And, and, and they he, arced uh, up. Eddie Eddie, a little Eddie. Bit. I think he set a trend. I think they all arced up too. I don't think the, uh, the 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 past players or media they weren't too impressed with them, but he I thought it was fantastic. And I, I love Matty Lloyd, great player and and great 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 commentator as well. He does a great job because he calls it how it is. But um, now Stephen Critiuk, boys, pound for pound, one of the finest that I played with. How's that? Wow. And that's a big statement because I played with some great players. But for him, for pound for pound, he was one of the, the best and one of the toughest. How's that? He, he, he would have coached boys, I reckon, Hoppers Crossing for. Yeah. I think he would have coached there, oh, got to be over 10 years. Yeah, that's about, that's about right, mate. I think after 2022, he was coaching there. Did he? Um, yeah. Yeah. 23. 23, he was taken. Uh, Adam Contessa took over from him. But yeah, had a good stint there, Dougie. Yeah, it was a long time, Port Matty, wasn't it? It was ten years. Ten years, Paul. You'd just say longer. Yeah, about ten years, Dougie. Yeah, good, good stint. Yeah, yeah, no, no. He was a very good coach too. Very good coach of the footy. I watched. I, I, I went and done a few functions at the Opus Cross and Footy Club. Listened to him talk to the playing group. Very measured. Uh, kept kept it fairly simple. Um, uh, but again, Stephen Critiok to me, one of my favourite players. Uh, Western Suburbs boy, obviously, but he just had that. Uh, again, he just had that ability to play on the good players, the good forwards. He played on them, and and did a very, very, very good job. He was a star. He was actually was a star, Stephen Crudiuk. We'd love to hear that. And you know what else I'm hearing? That doorbell. Um, he's probably pressing it with his left hand. His right hand's probably still slapping uh, Matty <laughs> a little bit. But um, let's get him in. <laughs> flower, good on you, Flower. Keep, keep your hands behind you, Dougie. Keep your hands Boy, behind you. There he comes. There comes Flower. <laughs> Thanks, Dougie. Well, you money, 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 money. Love it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Inside the Kennel podcast. Today's VIP Bulldog is none other than a 170-game veteran. It's the beast from the main road east, the St. Albans Flower, an all-round tough guy, Super Steve Kribiak. Steve, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks, guys. Privileged to be here. Fantastic. We're delighted to have you on board, Steve. And um, look, we always start by asking our guests in their own words. For, for people who've never got to see you play, how would you describe yourself as a player? And also, is there anyone in the current Bulldog lineup that you might sort of link yourself to or be similar to? Um, I've always said that I was an average player, that um, got the best out of, out of every single ounce of ability I, I had. Um, you know, I was never anything special, but, you know, at the end of the day, I just played my role for the side and, you know, it got me through quite a few years at the Bulldogs and that's pretty much sums up who I am and what I did. You know, I never did anything special, but um, just tried to do my role for the side and that pretty much sums me up. But um, I suppose, uh, I don't know, footage changed a fair bit. I, I suppose um, Gardner maybe is a bit of a lockdown backman. Just, um, you know, see the ball, fist it as far as you can. I would have loved to um, sort of liken myself to a Liam Jones, the way he backs himself in and intercepts. But, yeah, it just wasn't me, unfortunately. I must tell you, Steve, every every person we have on this show says the same thing as you do. They just talk themselves down and, and say, you know, it was, I was a pretty average player. I just worked hard. So we don't we don't believe you for a sec, mate. Tell us Liver, about Liver, your talk himself down. Have you had liver on liver on yet? <laughs> talk himself up. I should have won more Brownlows and. Uh... <laughs> I don't think I was part of that one. I think Maddie took that one, so Maddie could probably comment on that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Steve, tell us about your upbringing. I'm always this is a question I always love to ask guests. Uh, I'm just fascinated about the people that influence you, your mentors, your inspirations. Um, uh, you know who who. I think to make AFL and to play regular AFL football, you, you've got to have the right um, models, you know, in, in your life. Who were yours? And tell us a bit about your journey from when you got introduced to the footy and, and the clubs and your pathways. Yeah, well, obviously, uh, as, you, as you said in the intro, out St Albans Way, Main Road, just off Main Road East, I suppose. Um, but so I grew up in St Albans and started playing footy when I was nine years old. Um yeah, Dad chucked us in the back of the ute. So we used to ride in the back of the ute in those days to footy training. Myself and a good my, my best friend, Jason Fitzpatrick. So we used to, we head down to under nine together and um, and it just sort of, it was just a, a weekend thing and my whole family got involved. Um, my dad, my mum, 
where my sisters grew up, they get involved. And my two sisters now are pretty much running the Snowman's Footy Club nearly. Um, so they're still, they're still there. But um, yeah, no, I just grew up and um, played footy and went through the uh, divisions and, you know, got to under 17s. Um, and we, I think we went through undefeated, won a grand final and, yeah, got asked down to Bulldogs under 19s. But right up until then, I suppose even right up until I ended up playing reserves, I, I never aspired to play AFL footy. Um, never. I just went and played, you know, and, it was, and so there was no pressure on me to perform. Um, there was no expectation. It was just I was playing a game that I loved and that was it. And I always played it to the best I could. Um, you know, I'm a pretty competitive sort of person. Um, so I sort of hated to lose more than wanted to win. So I was always competitive on the on the footy field. So um, yeah, I, as, as I said, never aspired to play AFL. It just happened. It's those you know sliding door moments in your life that things happen. And yeah, went down to under 19s and I don't I don't think I made the first couple of games. Went back to Snorlands and yeah, you know, that was I remember that was the first preseason I've ever done at, at Bulldogs. And I was always pretty fit. I was a good long distance runner, so I was always up the front in preseason and. And even like that, and just didn't get a game. And and I remember your first game or two games at St Albans. Went back and played under 17s. Um, you know, I reckon I got about 40 touches, and I've never had 40 touches in the whole season. Wow. You know, so it was amazing. Like you know, doing a preseason at a high level, training with really you know high end local talent around the area. My footy just went through the roof. And uh, yeah, after that, after a couple of games of local, went back to under 19s, and yeah, just progress from there I suppose. Do you think coming yeah. in without that, without that pressure on Steve was an advantage? I know these days kids have pathways, there's huge amounts of expectation, they've got to tick all the boxes on the way from being 12 year olds right up to being 18 year olds do you think coming in without any expectation made you a relaxed and, and calmer, happier person? Oh, I, I, 100%, I never thought about playing AFL it was just about going out there and playing a game of footy um, you know I coached at Western Jets for five years and had a lot of parents put a lot of pressure on kids that, you know, our kid, kids, you know, when they're out in local footy or school footy, they're a big fish in a small pond. All of a sudden, they're, you know, they're the best of the best. They're, they're really tearing up local footy. But uh, they come into the Jets program and every parent sees what they're doing over, uh, say, Bernard's or Werribee or whatever. And all of a sudden, uh, oh, my kid's going to play AFL, you know, and they put that pressure on them. Um, and uh, and they come into the system, and there's a lot of pressure on these kids. And and you know, when I was there, I think we we'd ask a hundred kids down, and the average was one or two got drafted each year out of that hundred. So I mean, like it's it's not good for the kids because they put all their eggs in one basket. Yeah. Tell us about your old man, mate. Your old man, from what I read on you, Wikipedia, Wikipedia, I must say, is a bit of a legend. He's got a, he's, uh, look, forgive me, I've forgotten his nickname, but what, what's your dad's nickname from where he comes from? Well, it was Crusher. and That's it. Then they start, started calling me Little Crusher, so my, my nickname's now Crusher. They've abbreviated it, so I'm, I'm the second generation Crusher. And um, tell me, so, what, what made him such a great man? Is he a great administrator, a great footballer? What, what was uh, wonderful about him? Oh, my dad wasn't a footballer. He would have been a, he would have been under fifty kegs. He he uh, he smoked every day. He would have he drank a bottle of scotch every day. I reckon like he was just uh, he was a bit of a lad. My dad, um, yeah. he was loud. He actually did radio with um, it might have been Tony Shebeki and 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 Kev Hillier, one of oh, the yeah. local radio stations back in the day. And um, but he was um, yeah he was always around a footy club. He ran the juniors when I was there. Um, I mean, I remember 1988, maybe I think, or something. He was he was in charge of the juniors and everything, and we had the Snorlands had the biggest club in Australia in terms of fielding players uh, from juniors to seniors, and he was a big part of it. Um, he was uh, Robin McGee's Bones' right hand man down there, and oh, yeah. um, Bones and my dad were were the thickest thieves, and um, yeah, he had a great relationship with Bones, and you know, it was interesting. You know, I was as I said, I was in the under 17s when. Dad was team manager of the seniors, and yeah, there was a, quite a few in, instances. You know, obviously senior footy uh, back in those days, WFL was pretty tough, and you know, like you know, ambulances and fights and all in brawls, and uh, you name mm-hmm. it, like it, it happened. And Dad got banned for life one game. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, he got banned for life. He was administrator, and one of the umpires, um, I think, manhandled. There was a big fight, and 
Sewell was replying, I think it was West Butchgrave, and and I wasn't pertinent to the discussions, but apparently <laughs> um, Bones told the guys to, if they get in your way, run through them. So in the warm up before the game, you know, they, you do a couple of laps of the uh, center square, and I think I think it was West Butchgrave who were, were doing their stretches on the line, and Snorbel just ran through. Anyway, it was a big oil rule, and and uh, your dad was out in the middle, and one of the umpires grabbed one of the players, and dad ended up dwarf tossing the umpire because you know you're not allowed to manhandle players, and so dad ended up getting life for the last of his footy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've you've proven to me why they call him what he called him, but very cool, mate. Yeah, he was a good man. He was a good man. He was uh, he, he was tough as nails, but he um, but he uh, he had a heart of gold. And like he he done everything for me, you know. Like he yeah. he'd uh he'd whatever I wanted he'd, he'd give me, and he was he was he had a really big heart in him, you know. So again, my research, and I thought this was fantastic. Both Maddie and I are are um are teachers, and you it's mentioned that you uh, played a game called No Rules Ga- Gaelic Football or No Rules Gaelic. Now, if I get it right, you've got a Gaelic or a soccer ball, and you basically have a, a playing space on the oval and. There's no rules. You just throw the ball there and all of a sudden, bang, you smash against each other and try and get the ball from one end to the other. Is that true? And yeah. and, and it's suggested that you said that's one of the sort of areas, one of the experiences you had that made you a, a head over the ball type of player. Yeah. Like we had a, um, that was in second year school at CRC St. Albans and they had a footy over across the road. And um, you had a group of friends that were generally uh, sporty type friends. Um, so there would have been 15 of us or so that sort of hung around each other. We were all into footy or soccer, you know, a couple of mates that were down St. Albans, um, you know, some of my best mates. Uh, Jay Spateri, who played footy for Australia, oh, soccer. Yeah, yeah. Um, guys like that. So we had, we had a group of people that we used to play this game at lunchtime. And it was pretty much uh, Gaelic. Not that we knew it was Gaelic. We just played footy with a soccer ball. Yeah. And it was pretty much whatever happens, happens. You know, you tackle each other, you throw them to the ground, you just try and get the balls in the soccer goals. And that was it pretty much. And, you know, there was, uh, we, we got to a stage where it got pretty popular. So all the teachers started watching and we had a crowd of, you know, all the some of the students used to sit around and watch and it was full on. Like we'd, you know, then we had a sort of a gang of, these big gang like of these, um, I won't name the ethnicity of them, but they used to, uh, they used to sort of roam around the, the school and, pretty much try and you know intimidate people and they said they wanted to play a game against us that day and and we said no worries and i think someone broke their leg in the first five minutes one of their players and it got called off so we we weren't able to play it anymore unfortunately so here we are then you we've got this physically hardened boy from crc st albans and uh you return to the kennel don't you steve and it's uh i guess the year must have been around 1990 the under 19s and you start to carve your teeth. Can you tell us what it was like walking through those doors? And were there any sort of um, players who took you under their wings in particular? Well, it started, as I said, under 19s. Um, so it was pretty intimidating. Like, yeah, especially my first year there. Um, my first year there, um, you know, you're playing, you got this group of guys that were just like, you know, I was a pretty skinny sort of kid. And these guys are just men, you know, and, um, and, we had quite a few St Albans players down there. Like we, we had a really good junior. We were one of the best junior sides in in the in the Western region. So you know there was probably five or six or maybe more St Albans players down there. Um, probably about five in my first year, and then they probably nearly doubled after that. I had a guy like Corey Bissett, Georgia Bissett's son. Yep. who was a could have been an AFL footballer. Easy um, was a gun footballer. Just um, had a few issues with ankles and and um, yeah, loved loved drinking and loved being a lad and that probably cost him an AFL career, but he took me under his wing a fair bit and, you know, helped guide, guide me through. And yeah, it was, uh, it was, a, it was, a, it was an interesting time my first year. Like, um, you know, I was a pretty sheltered sort of kid. Um, you know, family was pretty, um, you know, focused on schooling and, you know, discipline and, you know, heading out there and seeing the likes of Corey, like um, turning up to games with a broken rib after coming straight from the tunnel with no bag. <laughs> <laughs> and kicking six goals. So I'm thinking this is the way you prepare for a game. But um, yeah, my second year was interesting. Like, um, so Nobby Clark was coaching. Um, 
So we weren't winning many games, and I reckon it would have been 11 or so players turn up for training each session. And I reckon seven of those were St Albans players. Like one thing, Bones and all my coaches through St Albans, they're really disciplined about training. You know, you get there, you train hard, you never miss a session. You know, rain, hail, or shine, you, you have to go to training. And that was instilled in us quite early. That was a good time. I really loved it. You know, I was doing my apprenticeship then, and, you know, I was getting up at 4 a.m. and hopping on a train at Burwood and, and then going to footy training. I loved it. Yeah, it was, it was the best life. Wow, wow. So how was it that you transitioned onto the, the senior lift list or the Bulldog list at that time? I think I played maybe one or two games towards the end of the season in the reserves, finals, and then just rolled into the next year, um, played some more games, and then um, pretty much got put on the list at the end of my second year of reserve footy. Um, yeah, there was no draft or anything back then, I think. I just got put on the list. And um, and then I think 92, I played half a year. And, yeah, in the in the again, I never aspired to play, even though then, you know, I was just happy to be playing reserve footy, you know, and uh, worked hard and got me opportunity, yeah. Steve, I remember that time really well. And you obviously worked incredibly hard because you played some outstanding uh, footy in the reserves. And then you uh, you got a tap on the shoulder, I guess, mid-season. And um, I remember your debut against Fitzroy uh, mid-season. Can you tell Not us? Not much of a debut. <laughs> well, it was, a, it was a massive win, wasn't it? I, I, I guess, um, you know, you probably didn't get a lot of the footy, but, um, but what a day to walk in and wear the colours for the first time. Can you tell us how that experience was for you? Yeah, I... I think I went. I got on the field and played maybe five or six minutes, and and Paul Ruse drove his knee into my hip, and I just couldn't walk. I like I caught this massive corky, and I reckon that I I reckon I got an injection right into that on my first game. I had a local in the side of my hip to try and get me back on the ground, and it didn't work. And um, yeah, I know, and end up missing the next week. Yeah, so um, yeah, it was it wasn't a good game to set my career up in, but. Um, it was just for me. It was a. It was great just getting home and and telling my family that I'm playing senior footy. For me, that was more important, and you know, stood out more to me than actually running on the field that day. You know, because you know, my dad, my mum, and my sisters. You know, everything was about footy, and footy was me. You know, that they enjoyed being around the around the club. But if I wasn't playing, they wouldn't have went. You know, so it was a. Um, it was something you know I uh, I could share with them, and I was more, more I was more proud of that and actually playing my first game. You know, to be honest. Well, I understand that in your second game when you did return, there was a there was a, a big gathering of St Albans people behind the goals, and you started on the wing. You kicked your first goal that day, and um, and then you got a tap on the shoulder mid game because there was an issue, wasn't there, with that with our defenders that day? Can you tell us what that message was and the uh, <laughs> a direction that uh, that you were given? Yeah, well, um, I do remember I, I was playing, I can't remember who I was playing on, but I was playing on the wing and and the call came back, you need to get back to full back on Gary Ablett for a bit. <laughs> anyway, so I sort of, righty yeah. So all the Snorlins, I had a, maybe there would have been 50 or 60 Snorlins players and staff and everything behind the goals and, and sort of ran back and I was, it was like this force field around him. I didn't want to get too close in case he got angry. Um, <laughs> But they're all yelling out behind the goals, and you know, back back then, it was it was um, you know, to me, it was I could hear everything. You know, I couldn't shut things out because I, I was new to it, and and they were touch him, touch him, flower, flower, touch him, and I'm like, righty ho. So I leaned out, put my hand over over the front of him, and there was a big roar from behind the goals. Everyone was looking behind, what's that? <laughs> yeah, touch God. <laughs> yeah, so um, man, that was a great experience, and you know, obviously, it's a played in him, played on him a couple of times after that, and. Obviously, for me, he's probably the best player to ever pull the boots on, you know, so it was, it was a privilege. Mate, tell me, when, I, when we were doing our research, when I was doing my research, you look so much bigger out there. I know you're a big you're a big set boy, but when you're six foot, is that right? You, yeah, 183, yep. 183. And, but you managed to play on some really big guys. So you played on Kerry, you played on Lloyd, and you played on Ablett. No, Ablett's probably 6'2", six, 6'3", six, maybe. But tell us... Firstly, how did you have the, the the front to go play on that bloke's that size, and and how did you how did you make up for your for your lack of height? And I know you're a big fella, so just walk us through how you played on a on a on a Kerry, how you played on a Lloyd. Uh, how did you manage that as a player? Well, Kerry was a bit harder because he was so strong. Um, but you know, guys like Richo and 
played at Richo a few times. Um, this is not for me. The, the taller they were, the slower they were, and I wasn't the fastest sort of player, so it sort of helped me playing on the taller guys. Um, so it was more about positioning, you know, working on your positioning um, before the footy comes in, while the footy's in there. And obviously back then, the, the chopping of the arm certainly helped. Um, you know, you can't do it now, but when you when you got a foot, um, a foot uh, you got to make up, it's it's pretty hard to get to the footy. So, um, yeah, but I suppose, the, the, as I said, the slower they were, the, the more opportunity I had to use in my skills and my craft on them. Um, that first 10 metres, I liked a bit of pace. You know, if I went for 10K, I'll be in front of them by a mile. But unfortunately, that first 10 metres, I, uh, I didn't possess much speed. So... Yeah, I actually enjoyed playing on the bigger guys more than the smaller guys and, um, yeah, less running, I suppose, because um, I was always a good runner like pre-season and I'll always be in the top, you know, two or three in the time trials. And I was all, I'd always hoped that, because when I first started, I was playing sort of wing, half back. I played 94, started in the middle a bit and played a fair bit in the middle. And, you know, it was just out of necessity, I suppose, for the, for the side that I went back to full back and, um, I suppose it creates a, and I was thinking about it not long ago, it, it created a negative mindset in me, like as I went through my footy. Like, you know, I used to, I, I was going through some some stuff, I was digging out some um, um, footy stuff out of uh, storage. And um, I saw some, some of my stats when I was playing reserves and even some senior footy. I was getting in the 20s and 30s and uh, when I played in the midfield. But you know, that sort of got drained out as I went along because, you know, you, most of my roles were ne uh, negative role. You know, trying to negate, you know, stop him is really important. You need to sort of cut him to one or two goals and that's it. So the whole focus and mindset is on defence a bit. And it, it's sort of, it, it's a tough way to play each week, I think. You know, you, you got no creativity, you know, you, the freedom's gone out of your game. So it was a bit, but for me, it was just, you know, you do what you have to do. You know, this yeah. is why you picked each side each week and this is why you're in the side, do it. But it was tough after a while, yeah. Fantastic. And, and what an exciting year that first year must have been for you, Steve. You uh, must have been pinching yourself. You're surrounded by the likes of Dougie Hawkins and Peter Foster and Brian Royal and Super McPherson, Stevie Wallace, all those veterans. And then you've got, you know, the likes of the Brownlow medalists that year in Scotty Wine. You've got Libba, Atkins, you know, surrounded by such an incredible team. And we almost went all the way. Can you tell us what it was like at that time around finals time or about around being around the club, being around those sort of players? And and did you give us a chance that year to go all the way? Uh, listen, um, they're, they're, when, when you're young, they're, they're a different crew. Like, you know, from when I sort of went through and I was at that sort of age bracket where they were at, like, it was just a totally different uh, culture, like, totally different. And oh, I really, I loved it, you know, it was... It was a relaxed atmosphere, um, you know, before the game. Oh, sorry, after the game, during the week. Um, but before the game, like, Wheels, he was probably, you know, no disrespect to anyone. He was my favourite coach by mile, like, the way he motivated me. Like, you know, he'd sit there in the, as we're doing a warm-up and he'd be pumped, like, he'd be steam come, coming out of his head and he's, like, rant, you know, rant and raving. And I seriously could have, they could have closed the door, I would have run straight through it on the way out. And... You know, so could all the other players. Like, they were just, you know, ferocious beasts, you know. Like, you know, they, they most of them had white line fever back then, you know. And there wasn't guys that took footy for granted, you know. That those guys back then, um, you know, you're still working. You know, you got the, ex the reality of what life is really about. You know, you're a bricklayer, whatever. You're going to training, you're working. And you got footy and you're getting paid for footy. And, you know, no one took footy for granted, I don't reckon, back in those days. And, you know, they were they were a real competitive beast. You know, they, they wanted to kill when they're out there, wanted to win. And, you know, as I went along, and I reckon times changed a bit. Like, and play, you could see players and, you know, even myself at some stages took it for granted what you had. And, you know, you get a bit complacent in the way you prepare yourself or the way you enter games. But back then, I, I found, maybe because I was young, but... I found they were really, really, um, you know, laid back off the field. But as soon as it was game time, like, it switched like that. You know? And it, it, they, they you know, we'd never lose a game because of, of uh, a lack of intensity or want. It was just the opposition were too good for us.
Steve, just quickly, when you talk about that, you know, I'm old school myself and a bit older than you are, but what I notice sometimes on when when the team needs to respond, I, I sometimes visually just see there's a lack of real grunt out there. And I know that it's all about systems and processes and and mindset, but sometimes I wish, you know, you'd see a player yelling at each other or slapping blokes on the back. Is that is that lacking these days or is just has that been replaced by, okay, reset, we do this again? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm not in the in a, in, in a sanctum there, so I, I can't speak. But like, I, what I see from watching them watching the TV is, you know, I see liver, young liver, when when there's a time and bond the same. Like when there's when they need an inject, injection or something, you know, both are totally different players. One's more outside and inside, you know. But when you need that grunt and that you know, that, you know, or something needs to change, it's got to happen on the inside. You know, when, when we needed a lift and, and it had to be, something had to change the course of, the, course of the, um, the flow of the game, you know, it's those hard inside players that generally do it and get the outside players out flowing a bit more. But when you're not winning that inside footy and controlling that inside footy, it's very hard to, to defend. And, you know, certainly liver, both livers were um, peas in a pod, I think. And Absolutely. Well, you were certainly an enforcer. Um, Steve, and in 1994, you had, you know, one of your absolutely fantastic, outs- most outstanding seasons. You were runner-up best and fairest. You played 24 games that year and um, and just imposed yourself as just an absolute gun. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that season? We made finals again there. Um, was it a real coming-of-age season for you? Yeah, it was. It was. Um, I played, you know, a fair bit in the midfield too that year. You know, I remember playing on, you know, um, Jarman and in the middle and those sort of guys. And, um, but yeah, for us, I think as a whole, um, it was a, I think we thought it was, was, you know, we we played, had a really good year, we made finals, but I thought, you know, we didn't flow on from that. There was, you know, and I remember, um, I remember reading an article in, in the, in the Bulldogs, in one of the rooms up there, it was Charlie Sutton after, after they won the 54 grand final. And it was an article in the in the local paper or the Herald Sun, and he, the, he was doing an interview, and they said, uh, and they're talking about the game. And he goes, oh yeah, you know, we, we got a really good list. We we won a grand final. And I think there's many more in the in the in the short term for us if we you know if we keep going. And that was not before. And I reckon that you know we we certainly um, you know took our opportunity for granted. I think, and uh, there wasn't uh, yeah we should have went on with it, but we didn't. Unfortunately, but you know, for me, it was a, uh, it was a um, indication of what I could do, and you know, as you said, it was probably my best year I had, one of them, and you know, I got asked to go down to sit up to sit up to Sydney, um, so I got offered a fair bit of money to go to Sydney. Um, I remember Ronnie Joseph coming down, and I think it would have been easy two or three times more what the Bulldogs would pay me. Wow! Um, and sort of, my dad was saying, "Hey, go, go for it," you know. <laughs> but, um, but I remember walking around the Oval with. Uh, and Gary O'Sullivan and um, you know for me I didn't want to move you know I never it was ne- money was never a factor for me like you know as I said before earlier on I never expected to play AFL so whatever I, if I'm getting a played foot play, you know, getting paid to play something I love I'd, I'd take what I get got you know and so I ended up staying and um, yeah had obviously a, a pretty poor next couple of years with with injury and you know, my preparation was different. Um, it changed with the coaches, uh, which is a shame um, because I thought my training in the prior to the '94 season was really um, specific to my body and what I needed. And you know, I didn't have one injury that year. I don't think I went right through the whole season, and the training really suited me and prepared me really um, as well as I could. And it's the best I've ever been. And it was due to that, that training I was doing over preseason. You know, we had running coaches. I wasn't running, you know, I could run 10K in 35 minutes, 33 minutes, no worries. But uh, my sprinting, as I said before, I was really bad at sprints. And you're never going to run 10K flat, you know, flat out in a footy game. You know, it's all about sprint efforts. And to me, we'd, that pre-season, we, I, we had a sprint coach, about 10 of us, and we were just doing sprints all pre-season, you know, um, and it was hard, but it got me prepared for a really good year. And that was the only year I'd done it, you know, Coaches change and pre-season change. Went back to running one, two K time trials and yeah, break down again. 
so as you say, 95, 96, there was a little bit of a downturn, but um, but then Plough came along and 97, the worm turned again for us. Can you tell us a little bit about that uh, that incredible season? Yeah, actually, during COVID was the first time I ever watched the, um, just obviously a couple of years ago, was the first time I watched that final, 97. I just don't know how we lost it. I just couldn't believe it. I was sitting there watching it in COVID by myself and I'm thinking, how do we lose this game? Like it was just like the the the, uh, the powers above just didn't want us to win, but you know that was my favourite year '97 out of all all the years. You know I really enjoy enjoyed our backline group. Yeah, like, yeah. we'll we'll just it was relentless. You know that, that our backline that we had that year, and I really enjoyed playing with you know and getting Matthew Dent down was one of my favourite, and he's been he's in my top five favourite players like. He was hard. He was, you know, we used to call him the psychotic chicken. Like he had, he had no filter on him. There was no, um, there's no off switch. But he, he was a great halfback flanker. Like he ran well. He tied, he had a great time timing with his runs. He used the footy well. But we had a really tough backline, and we were really close. You know, really close. And you know, Case was our backline coach. But we used to have our own little meetings after Case, and you know, talk talk about what we're going to do. You know, that's what happened with. Um, the uh, gardener at Whitten Oval that day. Um, like the club had no idea we were doing that. Like, um, yeah, so tell us about that. So the last game at Whitten Oval, okay, it's round 22, 1997. The Eagles are there. The, the umbrellas are up. And you guys trot out onto the field. You've got Danny Southern. You've got Matty Dent. Uh, a few angry ants out there. Tell us how that how that came to be. Was it? Are you telling me this was a spur of the moment thing? Yeah, so we had the, we had the, um, the pre-game with Gordon Casey. And we sort of waited around, and then Case left and waited till he got around the corner. And then we go, all right, guys, all right. There's a bit of payback time now. Um, <laughs> so West Coast um, tried to touch up Scotty West on his first couple of games and trying to try to intimidate him over in West Coast. So we thought, well, we're going to repay the favour. Who are we going to pick? So <laughs> the biggest guy on the footy field. But um, all it was was, you know, just uh, get out there and uh, – and uh, I think Danny Southern walked up to him and pretty much said, welcome to the kennel. And everyone just bumped into him and gave him a, gave him a mouthful and a couple uh, shoulders and elbows. And, of course, Matthew Dent had to take it a bit too far as usual. Um, from a push and shove to fist getting thrown left, right and centre with, uh, I think it was a uh, ball. Um, yeah, it sort of it, it went overboard a bit. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was good fun. And uh, we, that, that's what we'll like our backline group back then. We'll really tough and united and it was um yeah it was a uh, as i said it was my favorite year playing footy yeah and there was there was a fair bit of bad blood you talk about us paying the eagles back for touching up scotty but um even a, a year or two earlier there was the the rumble at subiaco with with danny and um peter sumich so there was some bad blood there was that was that really evident when you ran out in combat with with the eagles oh uh, probably after that yeah <laughs> not before that um yeah, that one with Danny still lingers, unfortunately, but um, I think some people should just move on. You know, I'm good mates with, with, with Dan now and still, obviously, but, you know, he's, he's in the association over there. And I think, uh, yeah, I think they still make it hard for him. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it was, you know, he didn't mean it. It was just one of those things that happened in footy, you know, like he's one of the nicest guys going around, you know, and he's a good mate of mine. And, you know, I think, uh, yeah, it was... Um, yeah, I mean, we were a good side and we had a lot of enemies that year. You know, I think we were the hunted. Yeah, yeah. You know, Libba, Libba said the same thing. He believed we could beat anyone. And, um, you know, come three-quarter time on preliminary final day that you've just touched on, you know, we led by, you know, nearly four goals. And, um, you know, the Bulldog faithful, a lot of them had actually left the ground because those were the days you lined up at the MCG to get tickets for the grand final. And I remember looking around thinking, this doesn't seem right. There was a mass exodus. That's how confident we were that we were going to get the chocolates that day. What was it like for you to be a defender and see the avalanche, the, you know, the Adelaide avalanche, as it sort of turned out to be, with the ball just flying into your quarters, left, right and centre, and you've got the likes of Jarman, um, you know, what was that like and, and and what sort of strategies did you put in place as a team to sort of try and combat that mid-quarter? I don't know. I remember it was just the way the footy was coming in. Like, I mean, I think Todd Curley might have been on him and I remember Burt, I think Burt was a runner. Chris Burt was a runner that time. I remember he ran out. I said, mate, just get me back there. You know, put me on him. And I only had one hand then because I, I busted my wrist um, halfway through the year and I needed a, um, 
a reconstruction on my wrist. So I was playing with a big cast on my on my hand and uh, oh. I couldn't do much. You know, I was pretty hard to mark. And but when when I saw the surgeon mid year, he said, you know, you need a need a reconstruction. I said, well, no, we're we're, we're got a chance of playing a grand final, mate. I'm, I'm not getting anything done. So, so I couldn't do much really offensively. So I remember saying to Burtz, get me back there, you know, and uh, and sort of whatever. But I think it was more about, um, uh, you know, our, our opportunities in front of goal, I think. You know, I think we might have kicked five points maybe in that last quarter or something like that, six. And a couple of those were gimmies. Um yeah, and like you, you kick one or two of those and the game's done, you know. Um, but certainly I thought that, um, yeah, we didn't have a, a an, I suppose, a, a call to slow the game down. Let's let's just try and kill a bit of time, possess a footy for a bit, stop their run, and let's try and score this next goal. It was just like, it felt like to me as a defender, it was just up and down the ground too easily. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, um, you know, obviously, footy's changed now where the calls will go out. But to me, like, we should have, we should have, as a side, said, all right, let's calm down, let's slow this game down. But we, we didn't do it. And, you know, it's, <laughs> it is what it is now. Steve, uh, let's talk about 1998. You play in this young gun uh, called Matthew Lloyd. You have a huge rivalry with him over your career. Um, tell us about those early games that you played against him where, you know, there was a sense that you had a psychological advantage and, and how that played out later. But what was it like playing on him? And is he one of the one of the more challenging forwards that you played on? And what was your relationship with him like? Oh, listen, I, every player I played on was challenging. Like, as I said, I wasn't the most gifted player. So, I mean, I remember Dig, Digby Morrell tore me another one. You know, like, you know, it didn't matter who I played on. If I wasn't switched on, like, I, I'd get... I get torn apart. So, um, but yeah, obviously he's one of the all-time greats, you know. But uh, I listen. I went overboard in the, in the first game against him. I, 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 I did some stupid things. Um, they're probably illegal. Uh, like in terms of, <laughs> I was at, I was in the social club a few weeks prior, and I remember I was just talking to the bouncer, and um, I was sober and I was driving. I was having a chat to Mark, who was over the head bouncers there, and he kicked this guy out. Anyway, he's pulled this guy out and he was, uh, the guy sort of started throwing his arms and, and was crying anyway. I said, what'd you do? He said, I just pinch him on the back of the tricep there. The bloody hurts. I said, oh, okay. I go, really? And he did it to me. My whole arm bruised up. I thought, all right, yeah. So when I played on Matty Lloyd the first time, I was just giving him little nips in the, in the triceps. <laughs> the of his game. And, uh, anyway, they stay you know, I had a good relationship with Sheeds and I think he really liked the way I play and they sent photos into the Bulldogs and his arms were black and blue and they said, you know, like, lucky we don't put it into the AFL and I thought, geez, I've gone too far there, you know, when I saw his arms and, you know, I got one pinch and my whole arm was black and blue and I pinched him about 30 times. You know, I always tried to push the boundaries without stepping over, you know, get right to the edge and you know, sometimes, you know, certainly that, that occasion I, I went over the edge, you know, and I should have been, should have got a slap on the wrist for it. Um, but, you know, certainly most times I've tried to get right on the edge without going over. Was that, was that a, a personal, is that, again, something that doesn't happen these days, Steve, where there's more onus on an individual to go out apart from the game plan and the process, but there's also room for you to, to put into the game with your own ideas? And would that be outlawed now or would you... Would you be sanctioned now again by the coach if you did something like that, do you think? Oh, that was stupid. That's one of those things that I got away with and and I'm not proud of it, but I got away with it. Um, and it was, um, I mean, it was a stupid thing to do. I don't know how illegal it was in terms of, um, you know, getting reported, but I'd always put my, I'd always know who I was playing on. And if I could get into their head, I would. I'd try anything. I remember played on Daniel Brad, Bradshaw in finals a couple of times and towards the end of my career, and I remember went up to him the first final in the first year and started pushing and shoving. And uh, I said, mate, I said, this is my last game. This is my last year. I said, I'm going out all, all guns blazing, mate, and you're my target. I said, you, mate, look good today. I said, swear to God, I said, I'm, I'm happy to cop 10 weeks. I'm done. And I don't reckon he touched a footy the whole day. <laughs> Then we went, we played. I played it in the next year. <laughs> it was in Brisbane again. 
<laughs> I did the same thing. He said, "You said that to me last year." I said, "No, no, mate, but this year, I go, I swear, this is my last year. I'm going to play it again." I think. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. And look, Steve, it was around this time that um, uh, we got it. We got we had an absolute thumping at the hands of the Swans one day. I think it was at the SCG. And post game, Plow absolutely ripped through the team. Um, I'm told that he said. Do you know what? Nobody deserves their paychecks after a performance like that. And you had a particularly challenging day on Michael O'Loughlin. And then on the Monday, you came in for your individual player review and then you had to face Plough and look him in the eye. Can you tell us a little bit how that conversation went? Oh, no, I pretty much walked in and and had an envelope and I had me check in the envelope. And uh, I walked in on his desk and pretty much put his, uh, put on his desk. I said, mate, here it is. I don't deserve it. And I walked out. That was it. I didn't say there was nothing else spoken, and he didn't realise I post dated it to 2023, so it wouldn't have wouldn't have, would have bounced anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, no, nah, so you know I didn't I didn't expect it back anyway. Like and but and player ended up giving it back to me. Yeah, yeah. So I heard um, there was a couple of games later that uh, you you played on an, another champion and and um, and held them you know virtually goalless and. And Plough came back into the rooms, I'm told, and said, you know what, this not, not, none, none of you boys know this, but um, this is a sort of investment that that Critter has in the club. You know, he's willing to give back his paycheck because that's how much he values his performance. And um, today you've actually doubled doubled your performance. You can have this back plus your pay. So is that true? It was only 25 bucks, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. But um, no, he was, he was a great coach, Plough, and very innovative. and. Um, you know, it was, um, it was uh, especially after Joycey. Joycey, I love Joycey. He was like my grandfather. I just wanted to hug him all the time, Joycey. But um, Plough was a different sort of person. And I sort of based my coaching um, philosophy around him a bit when I was coaching, like, you know, having themes for games and trying to inspire guys and trying to motivate them in different ways. And I enjoyed that in my coaching as well. And I'd take that sort of off how Plough coached. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Steve, you were a part of an, an incredible match in in two thousand. We we came up against the um, the unbeatable Bombers, and um, and Plough put in um, a strategy that's um, you know even revered these days. Can you tell us about that incredible night? Um, I can't remember much about the lead up, um, but I remember obviously sort of bits and pieces about doing training off site and stuff like that. But um, the game was amazing. Like you know, it was it was a massive build up and. You know, obviously coming into half time, there was a bit of a fight on the ground, and you know we knew we had them then. I reckon, like there was there was something about that moment in the game where you could see their frustration, and and you could see that they were they were a great side, obviously fantastic side, but they took their their focus off playing the game onto us, and you know I think Plow and all the players knew that if we just stick to our our guns and stick to what Plow obviously. Um, put on the whiteboard before the game and during the week that we'd, we'd overrun them and, and obviously great goal by, by Granny there. And um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. Yeah, it was a great feeling. And, you know, it's, you know, at the end of the day, though, it was only a home and away game. They went on to win a Granny, you know, so, but yeah, again, it was, you know, a great game to be part of. Yeah, yeah, they did go on to win the Granny. And look, we played a, a, so many consecutive finals um, through your career. Do, looking back to you, sort of, do you have regrets? Or were there any seasons in particular that you thought that was the year that got away? Uh, definitely 97 by a mile. Yeah, I just don't know. Again, like, as I said before, I only watched the game not long ago. And I don't know how, I, I just don't know how we lost that game. I was sitting there and I didn't sleep that night because I was sitting there going, ah, you know, I was just trying to think through it, like, we shouldn't have lost that game. Like and we I think we beat St. Kilda both times that year and very confident in 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 how we could have matched up against them. And yeah, it was just man, it was it was it was so heartbreaking to watch. That's, I I never watched it not for the sake as we lost. I just never come with I don't know, I never wanted to sit down and watch it for some reason. But I thought, why not? This is the time I'm gonna do it. And it was the worst thing I've ever done. You know, like because <laughs> You know, it still hurts me inside thinking about it now. Before, I just, whatever, it was a game that we lost. And as I said before, I don't remember a lot of things about games. But after I watched that, it's really stuck in my mind. And you know, I was really um, I was really depressed for a few weeks after that. It's, it's almost it was, like going back and watching a horror movie, isn't it? Because you can't do anything about it. You know the ending's coming and it's going to be brutal. But um, it is what it is. So, 
Yeah, it's it was a, it was a horrible one, and it's uh, it's burnt into my brain. And if 2016 didn't happen, I think I'd still be having nightmares. Like this 2016, I was in um, I was in on the Amalfi Coast, so uh, in Italy. So I um, I didn't expect us to win um, or to get to the grand final. So we planned this uh, trip, and I ended up winning a fair bit of money on the Bulldogs that year. But um, um, I ended up backing them right through the series. Um, I just kept doing it all up. I put 20 bucks on it, just kept doing it all up right to the grand final. And um, yeah, my mum and my nephew went to uh, took my tickets and I was great for them. I mean, my mum never missed a game right through my career. So it was great for her to share it with uh, her grandson, you know. So it was pretty tough watching it though, six in the morning with my sister trying to drink beer in Italy, like six in the morning. I'm not a big drinker at <laughs> the best of times, but you know, they were going down like razor blades. <laughs> Uh, what a what a what a day, Steve. And um, look, we, we we want to talk a little bit about um, and we've mentioned um, your old mate Matty Lloyd. But in two thousand and two, you talked about the regrets of the pinching. But two thousand and two, you made the headlines again. You came up against your old sparring partner, um, who was just back from a bit of a hand injury, and he was wearing um, one of those Michael Jackson like gloves. And um, I believe you gave him a little bit of a a fitness test on field from memory. Can you tell us about what uh, what unfolded there? If you're going to wear one glove, expect to get <laughs> right, You're going to dress like Michael Jackson. <laughs> Actually, I was wearing one glove too, so... It's, <laughs> That's right. Um, it's a bust of your finger. Um, but I did Well, it, it was it was more of a bit about by play. It wasn't... Again, it got blown out of all proportion. Like, his finger was fine. Like, you know, you had a footy field. If you got a busted finger, you know, you aren't going to play footy. You know, it's simple as that. Um... Uh, that's what you mark and kick the footy with, you know. So, um, so it was just a bit of by play, but certainly because uh, I, I remember he took a mark and I made him earn it, uh, as you do, um, and sort of plowed my knees into his back. And anyway, I was running back to the goal as he kicked the goal, and he sort of ran past and dug his elbow into me back, and they all started ranting and raving about, oh, he's going to be out with a back injury again, blah blah blah. And I thought, right, hey, if I'm going to be out with the back, you're going to be out with the finger. So I just uh, <laughs> gave him a bit of a couple of love taps, but yeah. There wasn't much in it, but it certainly got blown out of all proportion. I mean, I was getting in this house here I'm at now. I was getting, I don't know how people found me address. I was getting death threats from people in my letterbox, you know, like, you know, it's a game of footy, like. <laughs> and what sort of, was it, was it legible letters? Or was it just a yeah. sentence, like, I'm going to kill you? Or? Yeah, if I see, if you walk out of his house, I'm going to be waiting down the end of the street with a gun or the end of the air, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. But, was yeah, it? At the end of the day for me, you know, the guys that talk about it aren't the ones you have to be afraid of. It's the ones Probably the letters I didn't get, I was probably more afraid of. Wow. I'd be, um, I'd be writing a letter back to them and um, and saying, I know Danny Southern, mate, so you better back <laughs> down. I'm tipping the letters I got had no return address on them. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, there would have been a few Snorbers boys down there, don't worry. <laughs> Listen, mate, getting back to, I, I know you've spoken about some of the great players you played on, like Dunstall and Ablett and Lloydie and, and, and Kerry. But tell us, tell us a couple of incidences that happened with those sort of players that you played on. I mean, some of the less known players as well. Tell us some of the the, the good repetitive battles that you had with some of those players. Who were they, and um, and and why were they so why were they so great? Those are the one that stands out to me. Like the first one that I played on, um, and, he, and again, you know, the two I'm talking about are forwards, they were midfielders. So one was Robert Harvey. Um, as I said earlier on, I had a really good tank. So, so did Robert Harvey. Um, also, and I was sort of tagging him in a game of footy. And, you know, he'd run the length of the field three, four times in the first quarter and I'll be right up his clacker and no worries. And he gets get to a stoppage and his hands on his hips and he's breathing like a seal, you know. <clears throat> and I think, oh, beautiful. I got him already. Then you go again. And I think, crikey's. And I reckon... Uh, the first time I played him, I had him for about three quarters and he, he just blew my hammy out. Like, I just couldn't run anymore. Like, he just drained me. Like, I'd never seen anyone run that much in my whole life. Like, and every time he got to a stoppage, he'd breathe like a seal. And I think, I think I've got him and he'd go again. Like, the whole game, he was amazing. And I played him on him a couple of times, you know. And, and I actually probably enjoyed playing on midfielders a lot more. I like played on Nathan Buckley and... You know, I remember one game at Optus Sable, they had a really good game with him. Um, you know, kept him to 10 possessions. Um, kept him 10 possessions. I got 20-odd myself or something. 
And I remember we we played it we played the next year at Eddie had I think it was and I, I started in the back line and then he he got a couple of touches and um and uh, they put me on him in the midfield. And the first thing he said, I remember he goes, mate, that last game he played to me, I was, he goes, I was injured. He goes, I wasn't right. I don't know what he's talking about. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, last year. I go, last year? I said, build a bridge, mate. I said, let's go. <laughs> you know, like, but he was so competitive. Like, you know, he got me that day because I got him last, the last time. He just wanted to, you know, put his thumb in, you know, you're not good, you know, I'm, 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 I'm the goat, you know, and uh, he certainly did. But uh, I enjoy playing on those midfielders, you know, um, Bossy played it a few times and, you know, I learned more out of playing on those guys than I did, you know, playing on a Gary Ablett because you're more reactive to, to them. Yeah. By playing on those good midfielders, you got to be smarter and, and work your way through the games and across the whole field, not just inside 50, you know. I tell you what, if Bucks said that to me, mate, that would be the highest compliment I think if a bloke came up to you of his, you know, elevation, saying, "I remember when you played me," and I'm gonna, I would have yeah. thought that would have been a great compliment, mate. In 2003 was your final season. Tell us about how you felt. What 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 was the thing about that season? How does a great player know when he's had enough? So what was going through your mind, and and what was the experience like playing your, your final season? Yeah, I suppose I remember I let Rhodes, you know, towards the end of the year. Um, you know, I, listen, I knew my time was up and the biggest thing for me was I wanted to make the call myself. Like, you know, a pretty proud sort of person. I could see the club was in a transition with Lakey was down there at that time coming through and, and Ryan Argraves and you know, some really good young, young kids. And I didn't want to take their spot, you know. Um, one thing I, I thought, throughout my career, especially as a backman, I was, I was quite reliable. And, you know, as a coach, you want, to, you want to always pick your most reliable players. And to me, I thought that, you know, it'd be selfish of me playing another season just for the sake of playing if my heart and soul wasn't in a, into the footy and just taking a spot of those other guys. So I end up, um, you know, um, pulling the pin and just going out my own way and, yeah, I, I never regret that time that that I did it because you know as it as you know maybe Maddie Croft and Garlo found out the next year you know like it's uh, it was that transition period so you know I would have hated playing half a year or three quarters of a year in in reserves at Ruby you know yeah no yeah. that makes perfect sense Steve so can you tell us a little bit about um, some of your greatest teammates you play all in all you must have played sixteen seasons if you include the under the under nineteens as well. You know, you saw some some of the greats come and go. Um, who are you? Who are your absolute standouts in your mind um, over the journey? Oh, uh, listen, I, I always say when people ask who's the best player you played with, and I'd always say my best player, and that's no disrespect to anyone. Obviously, the best player and the best captain I had was Scotty Wine by a mile. Um, he was just a tough nut, and but he was a fantastic leader. Like he just spoke real well. Um, and as I spoke about before, when you need someone to stand up when the chips are down, when things aren't going your way on the ground, like he was the first one to put his hand up and get the troops in and deal with it on the on, on the game. And and he was he was a um, you know he was a he was a big reason why we we were so good at that time, and we played some good footy because of him. You know, he played on played with bung knees, and he'd always stand in front of me and cop a knee or two from rolling back in front of the forward and. But he'd never shy away from doing it, you know. Whether he's coughing up blood or, you know, it's uh, he was always there, front and center. And um, yeah, he was—he was no doubt, in my eyes, the best player I played with and best captain. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Um, but we love Scotty Wind. Um, what about the defenders? Um, you know, you talked about some of those. Um, you know, having a great relationship and synergy between some of those people in the nineties. You know, were, were there any um, defenders that really stood out for you? Oh. I remember Plough always used to say, I'm not playing you, I'm not playing Crofty, I'm not playing Sato, I can't play you three in the same back line, you're too slow. Right. But again, next week we come up, we're both all three of us in the back line again. You know, so we used to joke about it all the time and we still do. Um, but, but for us, we were like, you know, we were like the, um, I shouldn't say it, but like Jose, I won't say what they were called back then, but Jose, Liver and Dimmer, like, you know, myself, Crofty and uh, Sutter were like that as well. You know, really close and 
played a lot of footy together and all, you know, I'm, I'm good mates with Crofty and I'm really good mates with Salo and, you know, they were really down to earth sort of people and on my level, you know, uh, footy wasn't the be all, be all and end all for me. You know, I had other things outside of footy that, you know, I loved doing and for them it was the same. You know, Crofty had the farms and, he had a, you know, working on the career and, and Salo was just Salo, you know, like he's just... He's just there. He's, he's, he's um, you know, he's just one of those guys that just went with the flow as well. And what you see is what you get with him. And that's why we're so close as a as a defensive unit because of the, you know, as I said in '97, the type of players we had, we weren't pretty, you know. Oh. So you know, Salo and myself, Crofty was a lot better than us. Um, uh, you know, Matthew Dent was that Dow, you know, junkyard dogs little sort of guy, you know. We had a couple of pretty boys in there, Todd Curley and sort of uh, Craig Ellis that lifted our our, um, our rating a bit better in the, in the looks department. Um, you know, Brad Weir, but we had a good balance in that back line. I, and I really enjoyed playing that those couple of years with those guys. Um, you know, as, as, as you said, we had a good synergy with each other and, um, and they were really, really good blokes. You know, there was no pretentious players in the back line. We looked after each other. We had each other's backs, and you know, um, and that's why we we're so good. I suppose at, at that period, we had a really good, strong backline. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. you did. Um, the dog squad. I think you were uh, you were searching for. Yeah, that. that's right. That's right. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, post career, um, you became a coach. You've, you've spoken about um, Western Jets, but you went on. Was this has this been a really fulfilling part of your footy journey? Yeah, I did aspire really on to get into the AFL system. You know, I went in, into the Jets program and I was there for five years and I lost a bit of um, my my passion for footy at that level, I suppose, uh, for coaching, I suppose. Um, just the way um, you, were, you were told you had to be a certain person and you had to coach a certain way. And for me, you know, as a coach, you got to portray yourself as what you think you are and your philosophies and how you want to coach. And... It sort of drained me a bit of my my enjoyment for coaching. Hmm. So uh, I did aspire to go to AFL and um, had a couple of interviews, but, you know, it, it was it was a big impact for me. Like, you know, was, I really had a passion for coaching until the last couple of years of at the Jets and, and I pull, pull on the pin and I did one, I was going to have a year off and I ended up doing one year with just helping Bossy out of Brisbane doing some opposition analysis. Um and then I thought, I just want to get into local footy, just enjoy me coaching again. So I ended up uh, going to Hoppers Crossing um, in the WFL, and I was there for nine years and really enjoyed it and loved it. And this is my first year not coaching. Yeah. Wow, wow. So w- why did you decide to hand the reins over? I just, um, the little boy, he's, he's six, and I honestly wanted to spend a bit more time with him. Uh, purchased um, the gym last year. Um, so in Yarraville, so um, yeah, that's been pretty busy too, rebranding and getting the gym up and going. So yeah, it was more about the personal life. I still enjoy coaching, and you know, if I do coach again um, in the future, um, I wouldn't mind going up the country somewhere. And you know, where that local footy is different now. Like it's money driven, and it's that loyalty and that want, that passion for the club, and why you're there, what footy's really about is gone in a lot of local footy clubs, not in all of them, but in a lot of them. Um, in in a small country town, like the whole town's invested in, in the club and they want to be there, you know, from the netballers to the, you know, the the, um, the people helping out, the volunteers to the players, you know, players are playing there for nothing. You know, where we got players that are play one game of footy, want four, five hundred bucks a game at local footy and it's just... It's, yeah, it's it's sort of. I love to get back to that grassroots gar, grassroots footy at some stage in the future. Sometimes when you were coaching or the way you responded to something, did you ever post game think, oh gee, that was just like player, or was that like Terry Wheeler? What? How many how many bits of the coaches did you take into your own coaching experiences? I used to I yell a lot like um, <laughs> like wheels, and uh, I get pumped up before the game. Um, Joycey, I lose track of my stop clock on the on the training oval. So instead of five minutes more, guys, we go for the half an hour, as Joycey did. I, I'd, I'd take that into my coaching. And, and Plough, obviously, with his um, the way he motivated players and tried to, you know, obviously get into their heads before games. Um, I certainly, that's the way I coach as well. But, 
yeah, you know, you take a bit out of everyone, you know, like it was, uh, all your coaches are different coaches. They coach differently. They have different philosophies and, you know, you want to be yourself, you know, as a coach, but, right. yeah. you know, you do get obviously some ideas of, of people you've um, obviously dealt with and looked up to over the years. Look, we're coming very close to the end of our um, our podcast time, but before we let you go, you're used to pressure, so we're going to put you in the hot seat here for a for a bulldog quiz. Um, now, Dougie Hawkins currently sits on the top of the tree here, um, and uh, let's see how you go today. We're going to give you two categories, all right, without a word of warning. One category is bulldog goal kickers, or category two you might like to choose is bulldog debutantes. Which um, which would you prefer today? I told you I got no idea about footy. Um... <laughs> <laughs> um, oh geez, goal kickers, goal yeah. kickers, goal kickers. It is I'm always going over my head, so I might as well. <laughs> Let's see how you go. There's some true and false ones in there, so you'll have some 50 50 chances. Your okay. time will start after my first question 60 seconds on the clock. Good luck, critter. Uh, your time starts now. Albie Morrison was the first bulldog to kick 10 goals in a VFL match in 1928. Is that true or false? Ah, uh, false. Uh, it was true. Brian Royal scored. <laughs> yeah, Brian Royal scored more career goals than Chris Grant. Is that true or false? Uh, two ninety nine. I'll say no. False. Correct. Steve McPherson secured a draw by scoring with the final kick of the match twice in his career. Is that true or false? Whoa, oh, jeez. Uh, false. Uh, no, it was true. Uh, which which bulldog legend kicked five goals in his three hundredth match to secure victory in two thousand and eight? Uh, Brad Johnson. You got it. Uh, what was the nickname of Bulldog Spearhead Bernie Quinlan? Super Boot. Super Boot. In uh, Kel Calvin Templeton's 15 goal haul in 1978, how many goals did he score amazingly in the final quarter? Uh, eight. Oh, seven. Which Bulldog uh, with more than 100 goals has the most accurate conversion rate in club history? Um, Cook. <laughs> Oh, it was Tory Dixon and right on the siren here. We're going to give you a shot after the siren, Steve. Uh, yeah, no, it wasn't James Cook. It was Tory Dixon. But the final question is, Simon Beasley's um, club goal-kicking record is how many goals in total? Nine, 852. Oh, you got a couple of right numbers in there. It was 575. That was a tough question to end. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> Well done. Fantastic, Steve. Uh, we're going to calculate your scores um, and see how you did. Here it comes up now, Steve. Oh, well, you're not at the top, but you've done very well. Well done, mate. I can't believe Hawkey's uh, up the top and ahead of me. Jeez. He must have had the answer sheet. I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being part of that. Um, before we let you go, um, we do for all um, our, our guests, we um, we say, how would you like to be remembered? And do you have any um, special messages for Bulldog fans? Oh, well, not about me. I don't like talking about me. But, you know, I, I think the club's got to, you know, there's a lot of angst at the moment with the supporters, you know, with the way the team's going. But I, I think you just got to be, you know, stay, stay true and, you know, stick fat and just you know, have some faith in what Bevo's doing. He's, he's got us here before and, you know, Bulldog supporters uh, have been starved of success. We've been around the mark for a number of years, but, you know, we're, we've got a good group and a good coach and, you know, stay true, I think. Like, just, you know, don't get disheartened. It, it happens. We're there. We're, they're trying their hardest and uh, don't get too disheartened about the way the team's going, I suppose. Yeah. Beautiful words, Steve. And, um, we want to say thank you on behalf of all the Bulldog fans who tune in here and inside the kennel um, who have just absolutely loved you over the journey. And uh, those who didn't get to see you play, this man was an absolute superstar. We hope you've enjoyed uh, this wonderful episode. And thank you so much, Steve Crediel. Thanks for having me on, guys. Appreciate it. Legend, Steve Crediel, ladies and gentlemen. Red in my heart, white in my veins, blue in my brain. Oh,